for some reason. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this, the ninth webinar in the Sephardic Mizrahi Jewish Speaker Series. Uh, due to some technical difficulties, we have had to change the YouTube link uh, a little while ago, and we have sent the new YouTube link to everyone by email, and I think it was also put in the chat so that uh, people could switch to the new YouTube link. Sorry for the inconvenience this may cause. Um, a very belated Shana Tova to you all. Hope everyone had a great time celebrating the high holy days with family and friends. We wish you all a happy, peaceful, safe and healthy new year. We are very appreciative of the nine organizations supporting this series. They are Congregation Bina, a community of Jews from India, Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, Bet Raim Synagogue, Lodza Center Congregation, Kulanu Canada, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Jews Against Antisemitism Canada, the United Grassroots Movement, and the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Alan Herman of CIJR and I worked together on securing speakers and making all the arrangements for these presentations. However, we could not possibly do it on our own because neither one of us are techies. So we would like to acknowledge and thank Rajivan Virasingham and Fleur Sampson of Congregation Bina for their invaluable technical assistance in getting this webinar to you all. Thanks also to Ariella Daniels for designing the lovely flyer for us. And welcome to Catherine Huslak, who is here to help us and to help me get all the questions from the chat. This evening's presentation is being recorded and will be available to all who registered in a few days. Please check your junk or spam folder as this email will be sent to you from the congregation Bina. Please make sure you enter your questions in the chat and following the presentation, we will proceed with a Q&A session. This evening, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Ronald Gomez Caceres, our speaker on a journey through Curacao's Jewish history. He will take us through a personal journey of centuries of rich social and cultural Jewish history, as well as religious traditions and practices of this unique Sephardic Jewish community on the Dutch Caribbean island of Curacao. Ronald descends from Sephardic Jews who came to Curacao in 1690. He was born on the Dutch Caribbean island where he is a leader of the historic Mikveh Israel Emmanuel community. Now retired from a long commercial banking career, one of his interests is the history of his own Jewish community and its practices. He has been active in numerous organizations and institutions in Curacao. He has published in local newspapers, in the local, the social cultural Christoph and other local publications, in the American Jewish Archives Journal, in the Congregational Bulletin and has co-edited Connecting the Lights with historical aspects of the Curacao Jewish community on the occasion 
of Hanukkah in 2016. He has been awarded many decorations by the Kingdom of the Netherlands for social and cultural contributions to the Curacao community. We are thrilled and honored to have Ron as our guest speaker this evening. Welcome and over to you, Ron. Thank you very, very much, Anne. We're gonna go through the share screen thing and then we can get going. Um, right. All right, there we go. Uh, good evening. Um, I will follow the good example that Ann just gave and uh, wish everybody a uh, happy new year, even though it's really behind us. I will also do that, uh, giving you our uh, traditional wish at the end of Kippur, which is uh, scrito y sellado, uh, coming from the Spanish words for written and sealed. And I hope all of you were sealed with the Book of Life for this year. I want to thank uh, all. Of, I want to thank Anne and uh, Adam and the rest of the organizations for this invitation. I am very impressed with the way everything came about and for, with the way this this sort of this uh, presentation is coming about, including Raj with his uh, his technical knowledge and the other colleagues uh, that he has. And uh, my uh, my compliments are very impressed by that. Uh, I'm going to try to cover with you 370 years of 371 years of Jewish history in Curacao. And we're gonna to try to do that in between 30 and 45 minutes. So it's gonna be a, a pretty fast. Um, and you will notice that I will have a slide with a lot of text on it that I will not read to you completely, um, but that I will have there uh, for you uh, as you will be receiving a, a PDF, a copy of the presentation so you can read them and, and study them if you wish in more, in more detail at your leisure. Um, so don't please don't try to read all uh, the text and just try to listen and follow what I'm saying, saying to you. Um, so with that little introduction, let me uh, start with uh, actually where Curacao is because some of you perhaps have not have heard the name Curacao but don't know where it is. I'll go to the right side of the slide and you see a little red dot there all the way in the bottom in that circle. Uh, those are the uh, three of the Dutch West Indies, the Netherlands and Tillys. Uh, uh, and it's Aruba all the way on the left, and then uh, Curacao in the red one and Bonaire on the right. These are three of the Dutch islands in the Caribbean. The other three, we have to go all the way up to the Virgin Islands to find them, which is St. Martin, Seba, and Stasia. But this little thing here is Curacao. It's been Dutch as we turn to the, go to the left side of the slide. It has been Dutch since 1634. It became autonomous with regard to its own government, internal government in 1954. And in 2010, what used to be called, and as the map says, Netherlands and Tillys, which were the six, five or six islands together, each island is now an, an autonomous part of the Dutch kingdom. So we're still Dutch. We recognize the Dutch uh, king, uh, Dutch royalty as our royalty, as our head of state. It is not totally dissimilar to a Commonwealth situation, even though in a Commonwealth situation, the members of the, the British Commonwealth are fully independent. We are not fully independent. We are just autonomous with, it, with regard to our own internal government. Uh, the language spoken, we all speak uh, Dutch, Spanish, and English, um, uh, but basically 80% of us speak Papiamento. And I'll explain later on what this vernacular is and where it comes from. And we're really not very much larger than a, a, a little town, 150,000 people in all of uh, uh, Curacao, and it's a regretfully a declining population, uh, mostly due to a weak economic situation. Uh, Curacao's income is mainly tourism, finance, and various other activities. And about two th three quarters of the, the island is Roman Catholic. Uh, I should add also is Roman Catholic and is um, as we would say nowadays, African Curacao. Uh, the demographics, a very an, an aging population, over 60%, over 30% 30, 30 almost is over 60 years of age, and a very small bit of 15 is 14, uh, is below 14. So we're an aging population, uh, and we are very close, as you can see, to Venezuela, to South America. It's only about 40 miles of South America. 
And of course, that is part of what we will be talking about also. If I move on to uh, the Jewish uh, history, um, I, I think the first thing is that we we kind of realize where the Jews that came to Curacao came from. And I'm sure all of you have heard about the, uh, the Spanish Alhambra decree in 1492, uh, which determined that everybody who was not a Christian had to leave the country. Uh, there was a migration to Portugal as well as to the east, to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and uh, the first thing that Portugal did uh, it, with, uh, with all these new uh, arrivals that were the Spanish Jews, it realized that it could use them in its economy, and it it uh, converted them all by by decoration. The king basically declared from one day to the other all Jews to be Christian, or Christau of Novos, new Christians. Um, that made uh, the Christian the Jews basically secret Jews, and uh, where they would carry their Judaism in secret further on, uh, and 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 until the point that in 1536, Portugal also declared inquisition and uh, led to uh, Jews, secret Jews, leaving uh, Portugal, heading north to Antwerp and Amsterdam, uh, and uh, which were particularly Amsterdam, a rich uh, city in, uh, in Europe. Um, it found itself um, overwhelmed by poor migrants, and it decided it was going to create incentives, financial incentives, for these migrants to go to the Dutch colonies. And that's how the first Jews came to Curacao, uh, incentivated by the, the by the Dutch. Now, the Dutch governor was Peter Stuyvesant. You've probably heard of him. He's, in, he's also well known in New York with the Stuyvesant high schools and so on. But he did not like Jews. He considered Jews a deceitful race and, uh, and, and really was much more interested in building up a slave trade. So he actually limited the first 12 families uh, that came to Curacao to only tilling the soil, only to agriculture, about two miles north of the main city. They were not allowed to hold any enslaved or to have anybody working for them. And that turned out to be a, not a very successful settlement. They uh, pretty much were very devout Jews. And you can well imagine that if one gets on a ship uh, in those days, in 1650, to come to uh, a little Dutch uh, a rock, a little Dutch island near South America, that you you really had to you really want to exercise your 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 freedom of religion and, and be a Jew, openly a Jew. So they were devout Jews, uh, and the first word, place of worship was built very likely very close to where they were settling, uh, about two miles out of the the uh, the main city. Um, we have a our congregation has a letter that is dated October 1654, uh, directed to the illustrious gentleman, the Mahamat. The Mahamat is the, the uh, lay leadership, the directory of Panasim, of Holy Congregation Israel Curacao. So we know that in 1554, 1654, this congregation already existed and was receiving correspondence directed to its, its board. Um, it did not at that point have a Torah that came later in 1659, uh, and various additional houses of worship followed, uh, also in the, the small city, because since they could not make agriculture work, they made they made uh, commercial business work. They became merchants, they moved to the main city, and they started commercial trading out of the main city. So the first synagogue to actually be built in, uh, in the city was in 16, 1674, it was followed by another another synagogue in 1703. This was demolished in 1732. The current house of worship, our current synagogue, with a capacity of 600 Jews, uh, was built and consecrated. It was it was started building in 1730. It was consecrated in 16 in 1732. So this congregate this synagogue has been in use now for about 290 years, uh, for every Shabbat and every holiday that we have had in that period of time, and was actually the sixth synagogue to be built in Curacao in only 80 years' time. So they built in that period of time quite a community. They built the Curacao community, but they also built a very prosperous community and a very, very wealthy community that was able to provide assistance, including financial assistance, to many Western Sephardic communities. And in the first point there, you see the many, many communities that were 
supported one way or the other uh, by by the Curacao community. Uh, the second name I mentioned is New York, and New York Sharif Israel is, of course, the first uh, community in in uh, New York in the United States of Sephardic Jews. And actually, Curacao extended a mortgage to their first synagogue uh, to help build that synagogue. Um, so all of these main uh, communities and old communities were were supported in one way or the other by the Curacao Jewish community which was the largest and also the, the most generous one. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it's called the mother community of the Americas. We also, our forefathers also were very generous in supporting uh, initiatives in, in Palestine, or Terra Santa as it was going to uh, be called, starting as early as 1701. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, quite a few years ago here uh, that they were already sending donations to, uh, to uh, Israel. Or what is today Israel. Uh, in, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, so 1780, 1790, and the 1810, 1820, because of the economic and other circumstances, there was a lot of um, uh, immigration from Curacao to St. Thomas, to Jamaica, Panama, Costa Rica. You see some of the rest of the countries. And that's one of the reasons why uh, also in the Caribbean we're considered the mother community of the Americas. The St. Thomas congregation was actually started by Curacao Jews, so was the Jamaica congregation. The Panama congregation was actually, the Sephardi congregation was actually started uh, by uh, St. Thomas and Jamaican Curacao Jews. Um, so uh, Curacao Jews throughout the Caribbean helped create new Jewish communities. Now, what was happening in Curacao itself? And here I quote a, a well-known historian of the, air, of the region, a Dutch historian, that's the head of a, of a history department at the University of the United States. He calls Jews the most, the single most important impetus in the early 18th century for the development of Curacao as a regional financial and economic center. And because Jews were so important for Curacao as a regional financial center, um, they owned, they were shipbuilders, they owned ocean going vessels, uh, they were engaged in finance and insurance in philanthropy, in culture, in law, and medicine, they were able to support other communities in the region. So in talking about a community, you may wonder how big is uh, this group? How many thousands of people? Well, it wasn't that big. Um, the first Jew to actually step foot in Curacao came with a, with a Dutch um, uh, armada, if I want to call it that, who, that uh, conquered Curacao in 1634 from the Spain for the Dutch. Uh, he was Samuel Samuel Cohen. Samuel uh, he was an interpreter for the Dutch conqueror, and he was left on the island. Why? Because being a, a Sephardic Jew, he actually spoke Spanish, and he was able to communicate better with the Indian, the, the indigenous people of Curacao that had, had previous to that been under uh, Spanish domination. So he was left in, in Curacao as a first Jew. But of course, one Jew doesn't make a community, as we all know. But in 1651, the 12 settlers did start the community. Then others were, were added to it. Um, in 1659, 70 fellow Jewish uh, refugees that came from Brazil, um, Dutch uh, Jews, uh, Spanish Jews. Um, and in, 40, in 1746, Curacao reached the peak of its number of Jews. So that peak was about 1,500, 1,450 to, 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 to 1,500 Jews um, uh, was the peak of the of the population, the Jewish population in Curacao. Now, if you want to play this in context, right behind that first blue uh, line, I show how many Jews there were according to the library, the U.S. Library of Congress in 1776. That was only between 1,000 and 2,500 uh, Jews. So this small island of Curacao had, in some cases, more Jews than in all of the United States of America in 1746. Now that was also the high point because from that point on, as I've mentioned before, there was immigration, the, the population dropped to 10 to about 1,095, but at that point it was still about 14% of the free population, about 30% of the white population were Jewish. This uh, immigration continued, uh, the number of Jews continued declining, Till the last figures that I have were from 2017, when the total number of Jews was to, was 240, not only 
uh, Sephardic, but Sephardic and Ashkenazim, about 165 of our members of Israel Emanuel, the Sephardic, original Sephardic congregation, and the others were members of the, Sephardic, the, the Ashkenazi congregation, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Now, one thing that's special about what's unique about uh, uh, particularly Sephardic congregation around the world is that the lay leadership, not the spiritual leadership, the lay leadership was very firmly in control of the congregation. And this happened worldwide. Uh, I show, I, I, we call it the Mahamat. So the Mahamat is the lay executive leadership. Others may call them Parnasim. In Spanish, Spanish word is Directiva. You'll find that I'm referring to them as the Mahamat. The Mahamat was the lay leadership of the Sephardi congregation. And whether it was in Italy, in Livorno, <coughs> in Barbados, in Amsterdam, in Hamburg, in London, it was always the Mahamat that was in firmly in control. Um, they they were so much in control that they were actually the final arbiters of the spirit of Sephardic identity. They decided religious matters. Uh, they in, they uh, uh, kept discipline within the congregation. In 1756, <coughs> the regulation of McVeigh's Rail, of the Sephardic congregation in Curacao, stated all the way at the bottom of this slide that the Mahamat had, quote, full authority and superiority in the government of the congregation. And you say, well, that's okay. But it continues to say it could be neither contravened nor contradicted on pain of excommunication or of being fined. Now, in addition to excommunication, the, uh, the members of the congregation could also be banished off the island. Uh, and they would get the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the cooperation of the Dutch government to banish people of the banish members of the island that were actually contravening the uh, the Mahamat, the, the the leadership of the congregation. Now, I wanted to show you some some examples of these regulations as they are directed towards the community as a whole, because it shows how these lay leaders, uh, by the way, lay leaders who basically are all men. No women. They were. They didn't count in the in the old or Sephardic Orthodox community. They were all men, and usually they were the wealthier among the men. But they ruled the congregation. Uh, one one uh, regulation was that there shall only be one chief congregation, Israel, on the island, without it being allowed to form any other congregation on the island. So uh, those who wanted to form another congregation were declined. Uh, when they went to the governor and requested a permit, the government would consult Nikhil Israel, and the leadership would say no, and the governor would say no. Um, there was one case of a congregation that was started uh, across the harbor entrance, uh, Neve Shalom, and it was subordinate to the main congregation, Nikhil Israel. <clears throat> that subordination led to all kinds of fight, and I mean street fights, between Neve Shalom and Nikhil Israel because Nebuchadnezzar Shalom would not accept that subordination. Uh, and it created very nasty conditions on the island between Jews, between the Jews on one side of the harbor entrance to the other side of the harbor entrance. And why could they actually, um, uh, uh, why could Mikhe actually dominate this subordinate congregation? Because the rules was that there should be only one chief congregation. I'll tell you in a minute how this fight was settled. But the Bahamat, as I mentioned earlier, controlled religious services. They had to provide permission for marriage and divorce. Um, the lay leadership dictated the subject of the rabbi was not allowed to preach on, but also was required to preach on. That was dictated by the lay leadership, according to the regulation 1825, 33, and 75. Now, as I said earlier, the Bahamat would seek intervention of the governor to banish a member from the island. That's in the regulation of the congregation in 1688. Set the community disputes and bring peace after street brawls. I will talk about that. But there was one set of street brawls that could not be uh, settled by the governor. And it was actually settled by Prince William IV. The royalty had to actually issue a decree that there shall be peace in Curacao in the Jewish community. That's how much power these uh, lay leadership had in those days. Now here is a, that was how the Mahamat and the lay leadership controlled the congregation. But here is a couple of examples 
of how the Muhammad controlled the religi religious leadership. One happened with Sukkot, and we all, we all just went through Sukkot with the waving of the lulaf. Now, there's a particular way of, of waving the lulaf, and the traditional sequence in, 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 the, uh, in the 17th century was east, south, west, north, up and down. That was a traditional. Now, a few years later, and actually 70 years later, in 1745, we had a new rabbi, the Rabbi De Sola, and before that, Rabbi Jesserun, and they wanted to wave the lulaf south, north, east, up and down, and west, as it was being done in Amsterdam. Well, the board said, no, you, you have got to go back to the traditional. The rabbi refused. And as a result of refusing, uh, he was uh, he, he was forced to tender his resignation uh, and leave the congregation. He uh, he wrote a very famous uh, 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 article in which he bemoaned his fate of having joined the congregation, quote, to tend to a flock of, no, that he ended up coming to Curacao to tend to a flock of wolves instead of sheep, which is what he thought he was going to be uh, shepherding in Curacao. So to tend to a flock of wolves instead of sheep was Rabbi De Sola because he was ordered how to wave the lula, as small as that. But it's one even smaller. And then we had the Kazan, Kazan Pizza in 1816. And he would say, in blessing the wine, and he would say, Bore Peri Hagafen. But the tradition in Curacao was to say, Bore Peri Hagafen. And the board said, no, you shall say, Bore Peri Hagafen. And he said, no, I say, Bore Peri Hagafen. He was suspended. He was reinstated. He was, he, was off, he was forced to resign. The governor, governor uh, got involved and got him accepted again. In the end, despite appeals to King William I, he, he left for Curacao, went to St. Thomas, and became the Khazan there. So as I tried to say, the, um, the, the leadership, the religious leadership, the Hamad, ruled the congregation in a very stern words, a very stern discipline, but also uh, dictated above the religious leadership. Couple of points I want to mention here. It took till 1825 before Curacao's Jews got equal rights, um, but at the same time, uh, privileges were abolished at that point. And one of those privileges was the ability to uh, to uh, ban somebody from the island. That was abolished in 1825 because they became equal to everybody else that did not have that privilege. In 1864, there was a schism in the congregation between the more liberal and the more orthodox members. But there was a part of this that had to do with commercial rivalry. And that led to the formation of a, a reformed co community, Emmanuel. So there was a second community formed as an exception with, with governor uh, approval, but it was a liberal community. And it was unique because as you probably know, there's really no, almost no Sephardic reform communities in the world, even though today. That was in 1864, but in 1964, 100 years later, the Orthodox originally faced Israel got back together with Emmanuel, and they formed the, today's congregation, the Faith Israel Emmanuel, which is a liberal congregation, uh, which took until the year 2000 before full participation of women in governance and in ritual was, was, uh, was allowed. Now, when you come to, if you come to Curacao, which I will hope you do, there's more to see than only a uh, synagogue. But just to go to some of the monuments of Judaism in Curacao that you may really look forward to seeing when you do come, not if, but when you do come. Um, there's, first of all, the synagogue I mentioned earlier, consecrated in 1732. It's the oldest Jewish congregation synagogue and continues use in the Americas. We call it our Snoa, which is actually come from the Dutch word Esnoha, uh, and it was uh, it was bastardized if you want to snow up. There's a reform community's temple, the Emmanuel's temple, which are now government offices, which but which for almost a hundred years served as a reform community's uh, uh, temple. There is the oldest Walden Jewish cemetery. I will see pictures of that in a minute, which is in Blenheim. And there is the so-called new uh, new Beit Bethaim, the new uh, cemetery, which was actually founded and uh, was started in 1864. So itself is over 160 years old, or almost 160 years old. <clears throat> There's a Jewish museum that we'll talk and show you about in a few minutes. Uh, our language is strongly influenced by our local language, by Sephardim and Judaism. 
Uh, there's a Jewish, uh, there is what used to be the Jewish neighborhood in the 18th and 19th centuries with very large uh, state houses, um, uh, almost monuments, which are today monuments, legally monuments. Um, there is a, a, a private museum which, um, which uh, illustrates four generations of Sephardic Jews, a Mongi Maduro Museum called after a Jew, it's a Mongi Maduro, and the library and archive depository. And there's a couple of plantation houses that are also Jewish, uh, used to be Jewish owned, and are also part of all of the monuments of Judaism in Persia. <clears throat> so enough text, let me show you some pictures. So these are the houses of worship I just mentioned on the left, the Snoa, which you've seen behind me at the very beginning, um, or on the Zoom. Uh, so it's consecrated in 1732, and it's been in continuous use since then. We should probably put a little asterisk under the continuous, because we did have a lockdown during uh, during COVID, and uh, there was about there were about six months during which we held uh, services that were zoomed in, but where the service came out of the rabbi's home and not out of the synagogue. So other than the the COVID lockdown has been in continuous use ever since 1732, like I said, 290 years. And on the right is the Reform Temple, which was the Reform community's home. And by the way, that's where I grew up. Uh, and which was uh, their, our temple for 100 years. It may look like some of you that know the New England church is like a New England, New England church. It, it's actually, it copies um, the, the uh, Temple Emmanuel uh, Temple in New York City uh, in the period of around 1864 to 1867. That, uh, that the temple of Temple Emmanuel in New York had two towers to it. And this one tower that we have in the temple was actually um, uh, copying the, the namesake uh, in Temple Emmanuel in New York. This is the interior of our synagogue, of our 1732 synagogue. On the very left side, you see um, the Echal, the Ark, the Holy Ark, we'll see that in a, a few minutes again. Um, and you see the candelabras that hang uh, from the ceiling, uh, which all of them were donated by Jews uh, during the building of the synagogue. The candelabra right in front of the Echal uh, on the left side actually goes back to the 1703 synagogue. Uh, it's older than the actual building is. Um, there are balconies where women used to sit before they came to sit downstairs, where they joined us men downstairs. And that's the little picture in the middle. You'll see the balcony upstairs. And uh, the windows um, have this fan uh, with blue glass in them. That's not from the very beginning. Uh, that <clears throat> originally, they, that fan did not exist. It was added sometime probably about the 1920s uh, and uh, to, 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 the, to all the windows of the synagogue building. <clears throat> there's sand on the floor. Um, and we can talk about why there's sand on the floor. But there's sand on the floor. You can see that clearly. Um, and you can see the open echal. I just mentioned to you the echal where the the uh, the older candelabra hanging in front of it. Um, I'm not sure. I think that right now we have 14 and maybe 16 um, uh, sefirim uh, Torahs. Um, they all have their rimonim, uh, their crowns. Uh, you can see that there is a crown on the on the Torah all the way on the left. There's a crown all the way on the right, and there's a crown in the middle. Those are the three that we take out on uh, Kol Nidre. Uh, Kol Nidre, there's three Torahs taken out, and those are the three with the crowns on them. Um, but um, the colors uh, also change from time to time. Uh, so during the high holidays, all of the uh, the covers are white. Um, during uh, Sukkot, uh, they become dark green. Um, so they they they're uh, when it is. Um, um, the search of the temple, help me with the name. Uh, they're all dark blue. Um, so there, there's also um, there's also changes of the colors of the of the Torahs. Now on the left here, you see this is the Blaine the old cemetery, the old cemetery, and the, the website, which I strongly recommend you visit. Uh, this uh, the the oldest uh, this cemetery was started in 1659. The oldest known. Uh, um, uh, uh, the grave there is of 1668, and they were all beautifully, richly carved tombstones like these. 
which you may have seen also in Amsterdam, uh, the Oudekerk Cemetery. Regretfully, this is what they look like now, uh, all gray and uh, with very difficult to discern any engraving on them. And that's because of what you see behind us. So the cemeteries date from 1659 and were used up to 1960. Um, but the refinery, the oil refinery behind it, was founded in, in 1915 um, to refine Venezuelan oil, Venezuelan crude. And it actually became uh, the supplier to something like um, uh, half, if not two thirds, of all the fuel of the Allied forces in uh, this refinery and the one in Aruba, uh, of, of, of all the Allied forces in Europe. Uh, and during that time period, they were uh, working 24 hours a day at high speed. Um, the amount of uh, chemical emission was huge. And if, if in the 1930s, the, the graves still look like on the left side, this is how they look right now, barely recognizable and barely legible. In 1865, as I said, uh, a, the new cemetery was started. Um, the original cemetery was where the Jews settled um, uh, originally. By the time they moved closer to town and lived in the, in the town area, uh, the, the, the main city, um, they wanted to have the cemetery nearby. And that's what you see on your left. And these box-like um, um, uh, tombs is what 90% of uh, all the, the, uh, the gravestones are. There is one exception. Are some exceptions in total of about 75 um, tombs that look like the ones on the right. Uh, these are uh, all dates from the late 19th century, um, and they were actually about the same time as when the reform community started. Um, they are universal, um, uh, they're universal um, uh, funerary art. Uh, some of them are very, um, uh, very uh, gothic art. With very sharp, this is not one of them, but very sharp um, uh, point is the, the, the head up. Um, so there are some like this, which appear to be un Jewish, but they are Jewish. Uh, and they were, by and large, the new reform, the new liberal Jews in the 80, in, the, in the roughly 1890s and 19 to 1910. But the, the vast majority, if I look at where my how my grandparents, my great grandparents, my parents are buried. They all are in the box like uh, structures like this. What you see here on the left, a little house is called the Casa de Rodeo, and the word Rodeo means going around, or in in Portuguese rodeamentos, because the old Sephardic um, burial custom um, had a prayer that was said by walking around with the casket or with the body in a shroud seven times in the in that house and that's why it's called casa de rodeos where the rodeamentos were held this uh, has not been used um, for about 40 or 50 years now and it's not part of the reform liberal uh, burial custom so there is none uh, around this this uh, reform part so i mentioned earlier the uh, the historical museum uh, the jewish museum and it depicts the history of the Jewish Curacao from 1634 to now. It has over a thousand objects. Uh, it exhibits the uh, timeline of Jewish life, both Sephardi and Ashkenazi. Uh, and in the future, will be expanded uh, in the next year or two to include a war annex, focusing on this, how the Second World War was experienced in Curacao and Second War and, and people uh, from Curacao, Jews of Curacao, that were involved in in the uh, war effort. About half of the, half of the museum's collections are per permanent display, and it includes an old Torah scroll from the 1320 um, uh, that was uh, identified as such by a Torah scri scribe for us. I want to show you a couple few items that come from the collection of the uh, Jewish Museum. On the left, um, um, Anne said earlier that we published a book for the 300th anniversary of the Hanukkah, sorry, uh, for Hanukkah. And this was at, this was for the 300th anniversary of this Hanukkah. We still use this every every year 
<laughs> in the synagogue where we celebrate Hanukkah in the synagogue, this is the the uh, the Hanukkah the the Hanukkah menorah that we use. But it's not even the oldest uh, item in the synagogue in the museum. There is a 1706 besamim, this one here, that actually dates to 1706. And this is why we call it the Living Jewish Museum. It is not the museum of artifacts and objects that are not being used. Of course, there are those also, but an awful lot of the ritual um, of, of the ritual um, um, items that are that are being used today, for instance, at weddings, for instance, at Kol Nidre, for instance, at Hanukkah, for instance, at Abdallah, are are in that museum. So that's why we call it a Jew, a living museum. Part of heritage is not only buildings and objects, it's also archives. I'm not going to go through this, but I want those of you that may be interested in studying the history of Curacao Jews to know that there's archives and documents of the 17th and 18th century, mainly in Holland, uh, archives of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries are in Curacao. They are maintained in the repository of the Mongi Madura Library, which I mentioned earlier which is a private uh, Jewish library. Um, they've all been inventorized by professional archivists, and they have been used over the past year. Uh, I'm sure you know about the Sephardi ancestry of Spain and Portugal issuing citizenship to those that could prove the Sephardi ancestry. We issued well over a thousand certifications uh, of Sephardi ancestry using precisely the archives and registers in our, in our archives in Curacao. What kind of archives are these? Well, on the left here, earlier I referred to a 1759 Askamot regulation that gave power to the uh, to the Mahama, to the to the uh, to the lay leadership, and this is what it looks like. The original of that uh, of that uh, regulation, uh, beautifully decorated as it is and handwritten on the, the left two uh, archival documents, is in our archives in Curacao, and it's my. It's actually my favorite item in the in the archives. Uh, there are a, a number of ketubas, uh, which uh, this is 1832, so we're talking about almost 100, almost 200 years ago, and then they were also beautifully decorated as they are today. And next to that, you have the minutes of the leadership that are all that are available from about the 1740s on. They're handwritten in books. Uh, and the correspondence is also handwritten in books, uh, not loose, there's loose leaves, but by and large, correspondence of the 18th and 19th century are all, the letter has been handwritten and copied by handwriting in a correspondence book. Now, I mentioned that we're not only Sephardim in Curacao, there's also Ashkenazim. Most of them came, uh, uh, they started coming in the 1920s. They originally did not have a synagogue, uh, they attended services at Mikveh Israel at the Sephardic Orthodox congregation. Uh, our rabbi, Mikveh Israel's rabbi, conducted the burial there. Uh, the social, they created a social uh, uh, union, uh, Club Union, in 1932, uh, and held uh, and held services in homes and rented premises. And Sharit Sh the congregation, the Orthodox. Uh, uh, the Orthodox Jewish community, Shai was founded in 1959. Today, that is a vibrant Orthodox Jewish community. It's affiliated with the Chabad movement and with a synagogue, and has a synagogue that is an architectural masterpiece in a residential area, which makes it easy for uh, members of Shai to walk to the synagogue. Uh, our synagogue in Israel, the one I showed you earlier, the 732, is downtown, is in the old uh, Willemstad, the old main city. Most of us live in a residential area. In fact, all of us live in a residential area. So walking is basically prohibited uh, if you were an Orthodox Jew uh, and wanted to go to Mekhe Israel. Um, there is good cooperation between Sharik Sede and Mekhe Israel. Um, the, we have a joint uh, Hebrew school. The, the Jewish Museum is jointly governed. Uh, and when we have celebrations, which may be um, uh, the, uh, Yom Hasmaut or maybe uh, uh, some other some other uh, special event, but we do that together um, and of course respect each other's uh, uh, different rituals. 
as far as uh, is the, the communication with Israel is concerned, there is a there has been for as long as I remember. So we're talking probably for the past eighty or ninety years. There has been a honorary uh, uh, consul of Israel in Curacao, but our more direct um, and, and there still is an honorary consul of Israel in Curacao. Uh, she is in fact a member of the board of Mikveh Israel Emmanuel. Um, but one of our um, nice things that happened in 2001, where we celebrate the 350th anniversary of Mikveh Israel Emmanuel, again, I recall you, 1651 was the founding, uh, uh, 2001 was the 350th anniversary. The Bank of Israel in the year, in Kanuka in 2000 issued a mint set um, that honored the, the Curacao Congregation. And if you look well, on the left side here in that coin, you can see a logo, 350 and then the Machin David. That was the logo of the celebration of the 350th anniversary. And it says it here too, the 350th anniversary of the Jewish community of Curacao, Hanukkah Minset 5761, issued by the Bank of Israel. So there's a very, there isn't a, there isn't, I would say, an extensive relation between Curacao and Israel, but there is a deep uh, um, um, uh, relationship. If you were to go to what is today called the um, the, the Tel Aviv, uh, the uh, what's it called now, the the, the, the Museum of Hanusim in uh, in uh, Tel Aviv, um, there is a there's a maquette of our synagogue there, uh, and there is a uh, there is a pointer a, that that is used in reading the Torah from our synagogue that is in, that has been lent to the to the uh, to the museum. Now, Curacao has a lot that is Sephardic leg legacies uh, to the culture that we've left to the, that are part of the culture today. So, Papiamento, as I said earlier, is spoken by over 80% of the population. Its linguistic origin is Western Africa, spoken by enslaved persons, but combined with Portuguese, spoken by Sephardic Jews. And Papiamento, as a Creole language, was already spoken by the Sephardic elite in the 18th century. Now, why do I mention that? Because Creole languages, usually Creole language in Haiti, Creole language in Suriname, Creole languages around the world are usually spoken by the lower classes of the population, not by the elite. But in our case, Papiamento as a Creole language was already spoken by the Sephardic elite in the 18th century. And the oldest known document in Papiamento, is actually a love letter between two Sephardic lovers uh, that dates to 1776. And that tells you how, how different this, this particular language, unique language is. And all the way at the bottom, there are some words that we use in Papiamento, which come from Portuguese or come from Hebrew. Uh, when we say jeito, somebody has jeito, um, that is the same word as a Portuguese jeito, and it means he has talent, uh, he has drive. And when something happens nicely and they want to say best wishes, in Papiamento we say Beshimanto, which of course calls for Beshimanto, uh, uh, that, that is said amongst others uh, at the conduction when a, a, a wedding is condu conducted in the synagogue. And a big boss is called a Shongadol, Shong being the mister, uh, Shong being the word that is used also uh, to those that are the, a boss. Or owner of slaves, of a slave in, in, in past the centuries, Gadol being big. So Shon Gadol is a big boss. Um, I told Anne this morning when she wished me Shavuato that I give her the Papiamento version, which is Bon Siman. Uh, we say to each other Monday morning, we say Bon Siman, and Bon Siman means Shavuato, or Shavuato means Bon Siman. And last but not least, at the end of uh, the Kol Nidre, we wish each other, each other Bon Jujum. Now, what does bon jejum mean? It comes from jejuar in Portuguese, which means fasting. So have an easy fast, which we wish each other in uh, at the end of the Kol Nidre, uh, is bon jejum. Now, to some of you that may, be, uh, may like to cook, um, I thought I would include in the, the difficult readable here, don't even try, but hopefully when you get a copy, you'll be able to blow it up on your screen. Uh, this, first of all, our harosa, our harosa, we call it harosa, it's a, and it's quite different from the harosa, uh, the harosa that uh, the Ashkenazim, you know as Ashkenazim. That latter is a 
uh, is a combination, a loose combination of fruits and, and perhaps nuts, uh, apples. Uh, our uh, harosa is actually a packed, dense ball of ground dates, prunes, raisins, figs, and some nuts, shaped into a ball, very much like a a, uh, a meatball in, in, in a spaghetti uh, uh, dish, and rolled in cinnamon. And that is our harosa. Uh, and it's delicious, and it's, it tastes very, very good, very sweet, uh, when eaten, particularly between like a mimosa sandwich, uh, between two uh, two uh, slices, uh, two pieces of uh, matzo, and then ears of haman, uh, where the karos is difficult to to uh, to make. The ears of haman are very uh, easy to make. They're just deep fried flour sprinkled with granulated sugar, uh, but we use that only on purpuri. <clears throat> there are other things in Curacao that they say to you is also a Jewish uh, heritage. Uh, there is a very uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a cookie. Uh, a, a kind of like a butter cookie, uh, which we call pan levi, uh, which people like to say is pan meaning bread, and levi mean the the, the levi uh, of of, uh, of levi maduro and and uh, being the the, Sp the Sephardic uh, levi. Um, I don't think it is honestly. I think it comes from leavened bread, the pan levi. But some many will tell you it's actually a a, a Jewish inheritance. And one very um, beautiful um, uh, Sephardic uh, news today still is what I call the Sephardic Birkat Amazon. It is the prayer after a meal. Uh, it's called Bendigamos, and it has a very unique, um, unique uh, uh, um, history. We will all the way at the bottom on the left. There is a YouTube which Raj will help in a little bit. Uh, when this uh, in a couple of slides, when this is over, uh, Raj will play Bendigamos to you, so you can hear what a beautiful melody it is. But it actually, its origin is actually in Morocco, and from Morocco it moved to Bordeaux, where it was sung for many many years in Spanish, and Bordeaux was the only part of um, of, of uh, France uh, that, where Spanish was actually spoken. So this Spanish song moved over to Bordeaux, and from Bordeaux as a Spanish song to Paris. Now in Paris, it was discovered, it was heard in 1891 by somebody who was on the board, uh, on the board of the Parnassim of the of the, the Parisian congregation, and he had cousins in Curacao. So he sent that song to Curacao in 1891, and shortly thereafter we had Rabbi Corcus. Now, Rabbi Corcos had been in Jamaica, would from Curacao go to New York and go to Montreal. And Rabbi Corcos would take Bendigamos with him to these places. It is still sung today in Amsterdam. It is still sung today in, in uh, uh, New York. It's still sung in London. Uh, and the wording of it is on the right. That wording has been changed slightly. Uh, Corcos added some a, a verse to it in, in New York. Uh, in London, it's a little bit different, but it's basically the same song. Uh, we we use it um, whenever Jews are together. So at the end of our Shabbat dinner, we will sing Bendigamos. At the end of Pesach uh, Seder, we will sing Bendigamos. Uh, at the end of Breaking the Fast, we will sing Bendigamos. Now in London, I've learned there was a there was a fear. That by singing Bendigamos, the Hebrew Birkat Hamazon would not be said. So they decided in London, you know what? We're going to say the Birkat Hamazon first, and afterwards we're going to sing the Bendigamos that everybody lives, loves. So you'll hear it in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to say to you after this 45 minutes that you are now ready to go on Jeopardy. And I hope that in Canada, Jeopardy is as... Uh, a popular a, a quiz show on TV as it is in the United States and it is as it is in my family. But a question asked on, t on in February 2021 was this sea in the ABC islands of the Caribbean has the oldest continuously inhabited Jewish community in the Americas. And of course the answer was what is Curacao? And now you know what it is. So with that, thank you for your attention. And I can ask uh I'm going to close this in order to ask uh uh, rush to sing to play Bendigamos here. All yours, Raj.
I hope he succeeds because I can't sing it. <laughs> Bendicamos a el Altísimo, al Señor que nos crió. Démosle agradecimiento por los bienes que nos dio. Alabado sea su santo nombre, porque siempre nos ha guiado. Load al Señor que es bueno, que para siempre es su merced. Bendita sea la casa esta, el hogar de su presencia, donde guardamos su fiesta con alegría y permanencia. Alabado sea su santo nombre, porque siempre nos ha guiado. Thank you, Raj. And thank all of you for your attention. Thank you, Anne, for the invitation. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Ron, for sharing so much with us. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of information you have given us uh, today. Uh, and um, there are some questions. So, so we'll move into the Q&A right now. Um, one question was, is there a Jewish day school? No, there is not. There is not now. Uh, not the centuries, there were many. Uh, it's only an hour, it's two afternoons a week. Uh, mm -hmm. I think right now this we have a very small community, and uh, right now I think it's only like something like twelve kids set to go to it. Okay. Um, now you mentioned that the community today is very small and uh, and aging. Um, where did the majority of the Jews go uh, from Curacao? You the U.S. US. Uh, yeah, if you go back to, um, let's say, in before the 60s, before the 70s, uh, most of the, the university, university uh, beyond high school was to go to United, go to Holland. That changed in the 70s or 60s when I went to, to college in the state. Uh, and uh, there, is a, there is, since the 80s, there is a university in the islands. So it does, but a limited number of faculty. The, the, uh, but the, <clears throat> the main issue is that the economy is very stagnant and um, there are so many more um, specializations in the world, whether it's medical, whether it's biological, whether it's chemical, whether it's physical, that, the, you know, somebody that goes to university in the U.S. or even in Europe will have a hard time making a career in this small island. And uh -huh. that is what keeps many. <clears throat> and I say, I say it um, which in my in my uh, in my uh, voice, but I have three children. Uh, my wife's American, so mm -hmm. I made American and brought it to Europe. My wife is uh, my my children are all uh, married to Americans in the U.S. Have mm -hmm. built up their 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 life in the U.S. and uh, and uh, remain in the U.S. So you know, in my own family, there's there's my own kids that uh, didn't come back. That have gone there, but to talking about the community, what do you see as the future of this community? Very, very difficult. Uh, we're having right now a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a rabbi that left us uh, very suddenly in the middle of a contract in February, so we don't have a rabbi right now. We uh, we really cannot afford a rabbi right now financially. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 aftermath of uh, of. Uh, um, COVID uh, is still upon us. Uh, part of our income is tourism income. Uh, the country uh, that is paid uh, uh, to see the synagogue and the museum together. Um, uh, part of our income are life cycle events, uh, bat mitzvah, bar mitzvahs, weddings uh, of, of people that come from abroad, mainly the United States, but also Canada. Uh, and um, that income basically disappeared for two years. And it's now at something like 30% of what it was in 2019. Um, so, so we have a, a real difficult financial time and we have a difficult spiritual time. Um, we have lay leaders that conduct services. We did have a German rabbi for Pesach and for the high holidays. <clears throat> but other than that, um, we don't really know what's gonna happen over the next year. There's probably gonna be more, more uh, lay leadership. Leadership. Uh, did, did the Jews of Jamaica, um, Cuba, etc., originate from Curacao? A lot of them did, uh, in, 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 including, you just mentioned Cuba. Um, there were a, a lot of Jews that went to Cuba 
uh, I must say my a lot of my family went to Cuba. Uh, my my Curacao Gomez Casas family. My my grandfather was born that was uh, sorry to Jamaica to Jamaica. I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and there were also a number that went to Cuba. My yeah. father was born in Cuba. Uh, because his grandfather went to Cuba, his father went to Cuba in a, a sugar plantation and then came back to Curacao. Um, so yes, those are those countries, uh, uh, Jamaica, uh, the Jewish community of Jamaica, the Jewish community of St. Thomas, the Jewish community. Suriname is different. Suriname is actually as a community even older than Curacao, but of course it hasn't existed um, uh, continuously. It has been broken up. <clears throat> but Suriname um, has actually had Jews even before uh, uh, Curacao did, but it did, the Jewish community did not exist uh, without interruption as the Curacao one. As the Curacao. Yeah, we, we, we did have a presentation on the Jews of Suriname uh, several years ago. Um, um, one of the questions is, um, are the synagogue services all in Hebrew or in Papiamento? Ah. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. I'm, I'm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> It basically we use a reform prayer book, so it is a combination of English and and uh, and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I should say that on Saturday morning, so Torah service has a very healthy contents of Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, when the liberal community, when the reform community, Emmanuel merged with Nick Israel, mm -hmm. um, they were the same family. So, mm -hmm. the yeah. problem, who are you? Or who am I? Yeah. They were all the same families, but. The the what what actually settled the the merger was a, an an agreement to maintain Sephardic um, ritual in the Torah service. So at the beginning of the Torah service, we say a prayer for the royal family and the government in Portuguese. Uh -huh. the Aliyahs are all called in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. The Rafs are all called are all say stated in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. so the the Torah service. Is very much Sephardic, old Sephardic uh, custom. Oh. Now, having said that, mm -hmm. let me add that on Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. when we read, uh, no, before I say that, when we uh, when we announce the new moon in Rosh Chodesh, yeah. we the, the new moon in Hebrew, mm -hmm. Spanish, Portuguese, English, Dutch, and Papiamento. I think oh my I, goodness! <laughs> we actually announce Rosh Chodesh in many languages. Uh, in the afternoon service um, on on uh, Yom Kippur, when we read the the, uh, the Haftarah, we read about Yona. Um, we have been reading that since seventy since nineteen seventy in Papiamento. Okay, read I, I, the Papiamento translation of Yona, uh -huh. and we also read in the Yiskor we need, read a Spanish uh, prayer uh, memorial prayer. So okay, it's when, a mixture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm surprised that that uh, none of you use the De Solas prayer book. Like the Indian Jewish community, we use uh, the De Solas prayer book till today. Because it's very orthodox. Orthodox, it's very yeah. orthodox, yes. And Israel, before the merger, used the De Sola prayer book. Mm -hmm. But once they, our merger, and then I go into more detail with you, but our merger did not go to reform. Our merger between the reform congregation and the orthodox, orthodox. Congregation, Agreed that it, they would follow the Reconstructionist movement. Okay. And the Reconstruction movement had their own prayer book. Oh, yeah. We have stepped off of that prayer book because we don't like it as much, but we are still associated, affiliated with the Reconstructionist movement. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I'll... the Reconstructionist prayer book has a lot of the sort of bull in it. Uh huh. So, so in in reality, it also must be very difficult for Kashrut to maintain Kashrut. It is very difficult to maintain kashrut. There's no, uh, some supermarkets sometimes have some uh, kosher products, but you can't really count on it. Mm -hmm. People that hold kashrut either import themselves <clears throat> or stick to vegetables and fish. Uh -huh. can, can you tell us a little bit about conversions and intermarriage? What, what are the rates? Well, I don't, I don't have a figure. The rates. Okay. The community, but uh, conversions do happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one in our congregation was about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is that the rabbi uh, in this congregation would get support from the rabbi from Aruba and sometimes the rabbi from, from uh, uh, Miami in mm -hmm. order to have a, uh, a bed in. Um, so they, they're able to, to cooperate together. 
mm -hmm. uh, for conversions. Mm -hmm. uh, weddings, <coughs> weddings that are that are uh, <coughs> mixed marriages cannot happen in our congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot have it in our synagogue. Uh, so generally, that's all. There is then only a a uh, a legal uh, official marriage uh, with some kind of celebration afterwards, or perhaps. There, if it is outside the synagogue, the, you may have a cantor that may sing some a, a Jewish song, or or this rabbi may give some kind of a, uh, a wedding uh, a blessing, but mm -hmm. but it cannot it cannot you know they're not uh, official weddings. Okay, and uh, someone wants to know, Ron, where did you learn your excellent English? <laughs> well, I, I went to I went to school in the U.S. and my wife's American. So when I wasn't the right thing, and, and I, that's a good question. Uh, so when I say something that is the right, my wife usually corrects me. <laughs> but I've grown to to uh, I've grown to get correction now from my children. Uh -huh. It's uh, fifteen years or so, and they're they're keeping track of something that I've never seen, and they call it Opa's book. And Opa in the book supposed to record everything I mispronounce. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me when I came to when I, earlier on when I came to Canada and when my kids were born here they would correct me uh, to with you know I, I was more British and, and they they were more of the Canadian American pronunciation of words. We spoke um, we spoke English at home in my in my in my parental home we spoke only Pakistani by the way. Okay. I in, in my own home with my wife and children we spoke English. Mm -hmm. My two oldest my two boys my two oldest. Learn Papiamento from school. And of course, mm -hmm. I speak Papiamento with them too. And then when my daughter, who's the youngest one, started going to school, she learned Papiamento. And she would speak Papiamento to her brothers. And she would speak English to me. Until one day at the table, she I said something in Papiamento. And she turned to her brothers and she said, does daddy speak Papiamento also? So, <laughs> okay. So you speak many languages. <laughs> Basically, speak uh, English, Dutch, uh, Papiamento. My Spanish is uh, can be understood, uh -huh. but it's not uh, yeah. not very good. Uh, uh, someone has said they had a friend with the first name of L U F K E. Do you know anyone with that? L too many. L L U F K E. I'm sure it's an F. No, I don't know. I don't know that name. And did you know Susan Stock? S T O K. S T O K or S T O C K could be either. There is a the, the, the non-Jewish family, I believe. There is okay. a there is a. Oh, Dutch he was family. a businessman. There, there were businessmen in Curacao with that last name. Yes, there is. Yeah. But not, but to my knowledge, he's not Jewish. He's uh, he's Dutch. Uh, but you know what you do find is that there are particularly in Holland. Particularly Dutch people that have a Dutch father, mm -hmm. and they usually, partly because of what happened during the war, do not um, advertise their the Jewish father. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not Jewish themselves because they don't know the father. Mm -hmm. And but every once in a while, I mean, I have a very good friend in the synagogue now, who 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 is like that, and he yeah. converted because he 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 felt the Jewishness again in Kursa. Yeah. Someone wants to know the reason for the sandy floor in the synagogue. Well, I, I know that it's a sandy right. floor. <laughs> I'll tell you all the things you, you hear about, and there's four reasons that are given, and I'll tell you which one I believe. Okay. First of all, they say <clears throat> the Jews, as I mentioned also, uh, after they left Spain, particularly in Portugal, would have to uh, uh, conduct their services in, uh, in secret. They would do that in the cellars. On, on earth and ground, yes. or they might be up in their in their attic, and they have the sand on the, so that they wouldn't be heard. Um, so that was their way of hiding, and that would be uh, a way to remember your Sephardic ancestry. ancestry. I'll, I'll give you my comment about it too. If that's the case, mm -hmm. a lot of other uh, Sephardic synagogues that have sand on the floor, but there's only five, and that's Amsterdam, Suriname, Curacao. St. Thomas in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. that. But there's Sephardic synagogues in Istanbul, in all over Italy, uh, and they don't have sand on the floor. So why don't they have sand on the floor? So to me, that's a good reason, but it 
it doesn't it, it, it doesn't doesn't convince me. It doesn't convince me. Then there is 40 years of, of wandering in the desert. Yeah. And the desert of sand. Well, if that were the case, it should be not only Sephardic synagogues, but all kinds of oh. synagogues. <laughs> well, they also are. Then comes the one that I for many years talked about, and that is that God says to Abraham in Genesis that he will multiply the people of, of Abraham as sands uh, on the on the on the seashores. And that to me was meaningful. And for many years, I I I, I actually in tours that I get use that example. Until one day, mm -hmm. I went to the uh, website of the Dutch uh, Sephardic, what they call Portuguese Sephardic community. Uh -huh. It says, in the 17th century, people would have a layer of sand on their wooden floors so that dirt would actually not be left behind, but could actually be swept away. So that is what Holland uh, uh, has as an ex example. And, and now, it. when you think back, all of these synagogues, whether it's Holland, Curacao, Suriname, St. Thomas, or Jamaica, all have something Dutch, all mm -hmm. have Dutch heritage. So mm -hmm. I believe that the sand in the floor at these four as at, at, at these four other synagogues is there as a way to remember their heritage, but mm -hmm. specifically the Dutch heritage. The Dutch heritage. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, someone is asking about a family. They see the Riz. Was Nita Nitzer W I Z N I T Z E R family? Was Nitzer? Yeah, has completely well, well, left family. Curacao. What happens to La Confianza? La Confianza isn't there anymore. No. <laughs> uh, all the Wisnitz, all the family of the Wisnitzers live in the states. Uh, a couple of them are good friends of mine, and people I correspond with generally regularly. Uh, yeah. But they all. Uh, the business does not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. There were two brothers, which means brothers. Uh, both have passed away. Uh, the wives uh, moved away, then passed away. Okay. The children are still in the States and uh, uh, very, you know. Okay. And, and uh, the last question is with regards to the rabbis. The first rabbi, like in, in Curacao, they want, someone asked, where was the rabbi trained? Okay. Or, and and I I recall like from my knowledge, you do not have some someone can lead the service if they're knowledgeable. They do not have to be an ordained rabbi in order to lead services. That's okay. correct. That's correct. The second part to that question is that the Snoa even had a Curacao born Rebetzin. Is that true? A Curacao born what? A Rebetzin. Rebetzin. You mean a female rabbi? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start with that one. Okay, so we have had okay. a female born uh, rabbi. No, no. Okay, we have had a female rabbi. Uh, All right, but that's only since uh, or less than ten years. Uh, well, actually, the rabbi that just left was a a female rabbi, and before that, we had temporary rabbis that were female. But up to uh, up to two thousand and ten. Mm -hmm. uh, Never anybody, uh, any rabbi that was female. Now, where do okay. the rabbis trained? They were, when you look at the, the rabbis going back to 1674, they were generally all trained in Holland. Uh, the the uh, the uh, the schooling in Holland, the Eschaim in Holland, was very well known for tra training rabbis. So it trained not only Dutch, but it trained rabbis from all over the world. And by and large, our rabbis came from Holland mm -hmm. um, and came to Curacao. But from Curacao, they went, as I installed, uh, indicated earlier, uh, Hazan Pizza was in Curacao. From Curacao, went to St. Thomas. Uh, Corcos came to Curacao, went to Jamaica. From Jamaica, came back to Curacao, went to New York. I mean, we have rabbis that have gone all over the place. Um, rabbi Pardo, which was our first rabbi, became the first rabbi in Jamaica. Uh, there was a rabbi um, Lopez. There was a rabbi in Curacao in 1695 that became a rabbi in Barbados. Uh, we have a rabbi Jesseroon in Curacao in the 1700s that went to Jamaica. So we the rabbis by and large came from came from uh, Holland, but being in the Caribbean and being from into Curacao, they went from, from us to many other places. Many other places. Um, there's a correction. Uh, to, your point, to your point for a second, to your point about not having to be a, a rabbi. 
we actually had no rabbi for about 35 to 40 years. When you talk about rabbi, you're referring to like an ordained rabbi from the, yeah. from the state. We yeah. did not have any rabbi, I'm talking ordained rabbi. Yes. Yeah. We did not have any rabbi for about 35 to 40 years in the, eight, in the 1800s, in the early 1800s. And the services were carried on by what was called the, the religious Parnas of the Parnassim. Parnassim. The Parnassim would actually have three or four people on it that were, that were uh, dedicated to the religious part of, 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 uh, of the leadership. leadership. They actually kept the synagogue going for about 35 to 38 years. Okay. Um, a, 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 apparently the Rebetzin, when they use the Rebetzin, it, they mean it's the rabbi's wife. Okay, that's what they were talking about. That's correct. Sorry, that is correct. We do have Rebetzin, Rabbi's wife, that teach, and including right now, mm -hmm. uh, the, the wife of the Chabad Rabbi, Charitzer, is teaching at the uh, at the Hebrew school. Mm -hmm. and something that has happened before, too, yes. Yeah, any of them who were born in Curacao, any of Rabbi's wives were from Curacao? Yes, there was one. Um, Zellermeyer, um, uh, Rabbi Jerry Zellermeyer, and his wife is Heska Zellermeyer, and Heska was born in Curacao, uh, and a school friend of mine, uh, and uh, uh, and she did uh, help out, uh, help the rabbi out in the, uh, in the, that's the only one that I can, in, that I can remember that was born in Curacao. I can't think of any other one. Oh, no, other. Okay. Well, Ron, uh, on behalf of Alan, myself, Congregation Bina, all our supporting organizations and those who are on the webinar with us today, I wish to say a heartfelt thank you. Yashukua, you have it really, it has been such an interesting learning session with you. And that is really what we aim for, is to educate us all on the other Jewish communities that we are not very familiar with. Many of those who are here in the, uh, on the call today have visited at some point or the other, curious out, and they all send you their very best, including um, uh, the Veronas, including, um, what's his name, from Jamaica. Um, he's Ainsley. Ainsley. Ainsley is there. Ainsley is there. Ainsley is there. So he's also sent in, and a lot of other people have. Everybody has really praised and, and, and said how much they have enjoyed and your presentation and how much they have learned from all that you have shared with us. And um, so I want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And I know you've been extremely busy. Okay. And um, you have re really enlightened us on the rich history, culture, and religious practices of the Jews of Curacao. And at some point, I hope you will keep in touch with us even after today. I will. Okay. And I hope that, uh, I hope that, nice. I hope that some of you will come down to Curacao and I'll be able to meet you in our synagogue. Uh, absolutely. That would be wonderful. I would love to at some point. How um, many people have attended? May I ask that question? What? How yeah, many? You have attended today? There were about, I think, 155 earlier, 155. Yeah. We're down to 130, 130 something, and now 122. Okay. So, my compliment it, to yeah. you, man. And to you. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, we, we are indebted to you for your enormous contributions and achievements, both within and outside the Jewish community in Curacao. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. thank you to all of you for attending uh, today's webinar, for taking the time out to be with us this evening. Uh, we hope to see you all at our next webinar on the Jews of Barbados, which we are planning for a Sunday in January. We will give us a break for a few months and with the holidays and Christmas and all of that coming up, and we will meet again in January. Um, we uh, look forward to sending you a recording of today's webinar, uh, look for it in your email. It should come to you within a week or two from Congregation Bina. So please check for, for it and make sure you, you get it. Okay, thank you one and all and good night. Good night to you all.